welcome you again to the series of presentations entitled The Roots of Truth. And the purpose behind this uh, title, The Roots of Truth, it is our purpose to show that the major doctrines of the Bible all originate from the very first three chapters of Genesis and to a greater degree within the first 11. Let me say that again. This series of presentations, The Roots of Truth, is based on the observation. It's a biblical observation that the major doctrines of salvation are rooted and originate within the first 11 chapters of Genesis, particularly the first three. And when someone understands that, that person should begin the study of any subject as far back in the Bible as he or she can possibly go. To begin the study anywhere else is to expose oneself to error and to uh, false conclusions. Jesus followed this pattern when he uh, was explaining the events of the Passion Week or the Passion Weekend. When the Bible says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Also in Matthew 19, when the Pharisees came to him and asked him a question, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? That's Matthew 19, 3. The Bible says in verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And so Jesus took his listeners to the beginning as far back as he could go on the subject of marriage. And that was to the event that he himself carried out when he put Adam and Eve together. And in verse 8, after they brought another objection to his answer, as we tend to do, we never satisfied with what God says when what he says is not what we want to hear. Jesus said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, Christ repeats the principle, it was not so. And so Christ answers a question in the sinful world by referring to the way things were before sin. Let me repeat that. It's an example for us. When we have to answer questions about the Sabbath, we should begin at that time in history when there was a Sabbath, but no sin. If we have to answer questions about sex, we should go to the time in the world when there was no sin, but sex was arranged by God. If we answer questions about diet, we should go to the time when there was no sin, but there was a dietary recommendation. If we have to answer questions about the family, we should go to that time when there was no sin, but there was a family. What I am saying is we should follow the example of Christ. And as far as possible, we should go back to the beginning to answer any question, even questions on the judgment. We should go back to the earliest chapters of the book of Genesis. Questions on the philosophy of work in society. We should go back to uh, the time when there was no sin, but there was work. It is amazing how many fundamental questions can be answered by carefully studying the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. And that's uh, what we'll attempt to do in this series to a limited degree, because six presentations surely cannot answer all the questions that can arise. Our subject for today is the holy day. We will be dealing with the Sabbath, and we will restrict ourselves primarily to the first three chapters of the book of Genesis, particularly the second. And we will establish the roots of that truth. Once the root of a truth has been established, it serves as the guide for subsequent study of that subject. Yes, layers of truth may be added, but the direction of that study cannot shift from the direction established by the root of that truth because it is the root that counts. Hence the title of the series, The Roots of Truth. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. We shall read from verse 1. Well, better still, let's go to Genesis 1. We shall read from verse 1 of Genesis 1. Our subject is the holy day. The Bible says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Using the principle of studying here a little, there a little, we go to verse 1 of chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made now. We take the word work in verse 2 of chapter 2, and we use it to help us to understand that creation is work. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2 says, on the seventh day he ended his work. So that creation is work. 
By the way, the very first person in the Bible to work is the Creator. And the very first person in the Bible to rest is the Creator. Let me say that again. God set an example of hard work. And He set an example of refreshing rest. We're told in Exodus 31, 18, He rested and was refreshed. And so, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I think I said Exodus 31, 18. It should be 31, 17. He rested and was refreshed. God created the heaven and the earth. He took six days to do that. Chapter 2 from verse 1 tells us, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. This word all, in connection with the Sabbath, is mentioned three times in Genesis 2, 1 to 3. Let's read that entire passage. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished on all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now what is the significance of this recurring theme, all his work? All the hosts of them were finished. He rested from all his work. The Sabbath, at the physical level, teaches us that God rested from all the physical creation of the earth and the heavens. But all of creation is designed to teach spiritual lessons. In Child Guidance, page 45, paragraph 3, Ella White writes, The whole natural world is designed to be an interpreter of the things of God. Now, the word design means something done deliberately. Listen again to the words. Child Guidance, page 45, paragraph 3. The whole natural world, without exception, is designed, deliberately arranged by God to be an interpreter of the things of God. The very same book, Child Guidance, page 46, paragraph 3, she writes, In the natural world, God has placed in the hands of the children of men the key to unlock the treasure house of His Word. The unseen is illustrated by the seen. Divine wisdom, eternal truth, infinite grace are understood by the things that God has made. And so this tells us that in studying creation, we ought to look for spiritual lessons. It's on the basis of this principle that Jesus stole the parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. He goes from the natural, the physical creation, to the spiritual application. This is by God's design. No wonder. The devil has gotten into us to pollute and destroy the physical world. Because the more we pollute it, the less we see the lessons that God has there for us. That is why a faithful Christian should be an environmentalist. I'm not a politician, but we should do all we can to preserve God's environment. Because he placed into it lessons of his love. And so when we look at all, 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 thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work. The spiritual lesson for us is that the Sabbath is a celebration of a finished work. There was nothing else God had to do physically to provide a world for Adam and Eve that had everything they needed for their physical, three-dimensional happiness. Spiritually, when Christ died on the cross and he said, it is finished, everything required for salvation justification, sanctification, everything associated with salvation had been accomplished by Christ. And it was only when he had done that that he died. He said, it is finished. Then he gave up the ghost and rested in that tomb. That same Christ, before he took on human form, as the creator, it is said of him, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. So lesson one, which we learn about the Sabbath as we examine the roots of that truth, is that the Sabbath is a celebration, a reminder, a memorial that God has done everything necessary for our comfort. Not simply physical, that's not the most important. 
but spiritual, for our joy, for our salvation, for us to enter into a relationship with him that makes us one with him. Not makes us God, but makes us in a mysterious way one with him. All necessary, all things necessary for our salvation, the creator did. He provided all things necessary for our physical happiness and through the cross, everything necessary for our spiritual happiness and they are connected. And so we have all, all, all. Every weekend when Sabbath keepers observe that day, they should remember that there's nothing else God needs to do. It is up to us to accept by faith all that has been done for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's look at something else that's repeated over and over in those th first three verses. We read verses 2 and 3 of Genesis chapter 2 as we continue with the subject, the holy day. The Bible says in verse 2 of Genesis 2, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Three times we are told the seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. The spirit that inspired the Old Testament writers to write the books of the Old Testament was the spirit of Christ, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 11. And so Christ is the one repeating to us over and over, the Sabbath is the seventh day. It is the seventh day. It is the seventh day. The very root of that truth has the seventh day as the day of worship, not the day just of worship, but the day of rest and worship, because we should worship God seven days a week. That's not the issue. The issue is which day is the Sabbath, the seventh. And we're told that at the very root of that doctrine, the seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. Now, if you are a person who has an interest in biblical numerology, what do the numbers mean? Bible scholars agree that the number three is a divine number. It represents God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so three times, if you want to view it that way, God tells us the seventh day, because it's his day, the seventh day, the seventh day. And so when people go to Matthew 28 verse 1, and in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, I actually heard a preacher on the radio use that verse to say, see what the Bible is saying? The seventh day has passed, now we dawn towards a new Sabbath, the first day. I heard someone say that, and I said to myself, Father, I cannot understand how people read the plain word of Scripture and come to such satanic conclusions. The seventh day is the Sabbath. Of the Lord thy God. This has been the way it was from creation. That is the way it has to be. In Isaiah 66 verse 23 we read, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. As it was before sin, so shall it be in the dispensation when sin is no more, the seventh day. And so we've seen that at the root of the teaching of the Sabbath, we're taught that the Sabbath is a celebration, a reminder, a memorial of a finished work. Everything God had to do at the physical level was done. Everything necessary for our spiritual life, for our rebirth and our continual growth in Christ has been presented or pre uh, provided by the same person who created physically, and that is Jesus Christ. We've also learned that at the root of the Sabbath doctrine is the seventh day the seventh day, the seventh day. And we must continue in that vein if we are to be faithful to the root of that teaching. We go back to verse 2 and 3 of Genesis chapter 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested. So we have ended, rested, rested. And ended is an equivalent to rested. Because when you rest, you're no longer working. When you end, you're no longer working. So functionally, ended, rested, rested are all the same thing. Here again, we have three times. We're told that the creator, who was Christ, he was not called Christ back then, but understand clearly the creator is Christ. I was in a certain part of the world preaching, and I preached on Christ as creator in a Seventh-day Adventist church. Members came to me to thank me because they did not know Christ was creator. 
let me say it again, they came to thank me. They did not realize that Christ is the creator, which means if you do not understand that Christ is creator, you cannot understand Christ as savior because the two are inseparable. But anyway, Christ, he rested, ended, rested, rested. Three times we're told that the savior, having done a finished work, he ended it on a certain day. He rested, he rested, he rested. So at the root of the Sabbath is the concept of a finished work, is the concept of the seventh day, is the concept of rest. At the root of this doctrine. Let's look at something else. I've said in previous presentations, I'll say it again, when you read the Bible, read very carefully, almost with a uh, x-ray vision, if you will, so that you miss nothing. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Three times we're told it's God's work. It is not by accident God made Adam and Eve last and then did no more physical creation after they were made. When they opened their eyes, everything necessary for them was provided. They could not claim to have made one blade of grass. They were standing on the grass. One petal from one flower, they were enjoying its beauty. Everything necessary for our vibrant ecosystem, fit for human beings and animals and plant life, provided. By whom? By God. Now the creator could have made Adam on day one and said, Adam, help me to create. You do that, you create grass, I'll create trees. You create insects, I'll create the huge animals. No. Adam did not exist until God had made everything prior to Adam that was necessary for a bountiful world. And so the Bible correctly says it was his work. His work. His work three times. Here again we have that divine number, and I don't want to make too much of the divine number, but there's something to it three times. His work, the root of the Sabbath truth lets us know that creation and salvation are the work of God. That's why the law can't save you. And coming from me, that may sound strange because I love to talk about the law. But the law cannot save you. Only the creator can save you. Because he's the same one who functions as savior. His work of creation, that's his work. Salvation, his work. There's none other name under heaven whereby we must be saved but by the name of the creator. That's Jesus Christ. So it is his work to create. And salvation is a spiritual work of creation. When Christ created the heavens and the earth, he created from nothing. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 tells us, through faith we understand. Let me pause on that and speak to you scientists. The scientist, his or her method of understanding or believing is to understand first, then believe. That's a scientific method. In other words, I must be able to measure it. And measurement is done by the eye, the ear, the nose, the taste, the touch, it must be measurable or it doesn't exist. And anything measurable is something that is comprehensible by the sensory apparatus. Beyond that, it doesn't exist as the scientist goes. The Bible says in Hebrews 11:3, through faith we understand. That's the precise reversal. We come to God by faith, why? Because the very first chapter, as we said in the previous presentation, gives us the reason why you can trust his word and come by faith, because his word created all of that. And God said, and God said, and God said. And so we come to God by faith, and because of faith, God reveals and reveals to us. Now the verse goes on to say, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen we're not made of things which do appear. The, the, the Bible scholars call that creation ex nihilo, out of nothing. Now I said creation and salvation are related. One is physical, one is spiritual. Salvation is spiritual creation. As God created out of nothing at a physical level, he saves the same way. 
He creates out of nothing. Let me explain. Romans 7, 18, Paul says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth what? No good thing. Nothing good in the flesh. In other words, the flesh cannot come to God and say, Father, here is a little raw material. Start with this and transform. You can't do that. There's nothing we can offer. Galatians 5, 17, Paul says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary. There is no similarity between the flesh and the spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. There is nothing of the flesh in the spirit, nothing of the spirit in the flesh. Jesus himself said in John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. That's why they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The flesh profiteth nothing. Therefore, for God to do a work of transformation in our lives, he must do it out of nothing. There's nothing we have. That's why salvation is spiritual creation. It is brought about by the word, James 1.18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And so it is his work. Only God can save us. Christ, his work, his work, his work. The Sabbath is a constant reminder that only the Creator can save us, the one who created. And by the very same power, the very same divine instrumentality, the Word, that is how He saves us. The Sabbath truth, the root of it tells us, it's a constant reminder of the remarkable power of the Creator to save us. But there's something else associated with His work. Let's take a look at it. And on the seventh day, God ended His work, which He had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now, we have an interesting uh, development here. We have his work, which he had made. His work, which he had made. His work, which God created and made. Now, the, 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 the text could have said, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, without saying, which he had made but it would have been incomplete. Let me tell you why. It was necessary to have which he had made. What that expression tells us, that his work is a work only he could have done. Now, if you buy a Toyota, you can take it to a mechanic who fixes Datsun, uh, not Datsuns, uh, Hondas, and he'll fix your car because all cars are essentially built the same way. Are you with me? So a Toyota mechanic can fix a, a Honda if he's, any, <laughs> if he's worth his salt in his studies as a mechanic. But what God does, no one else can do. Are you with me? Someone built this auditorium. Someone else could have built it. Someone made this jacket. Someone else could have made it. Any tailor can make this jacket beside the one who made it. But creation is his work, which he had made because no one else could do what Christ did. Let me be more inclusive. No one else can do what God does. So God's work is his work which he had made. The Sabbath reminds us that what God does for us, no one else can do. Certainly not Satan, not a family member, not your boss, not your career, not social connections. God's work in your life and mine, what he does, he alone can do. And of course, Christ being the creator, Christ being God, the work of God in our lives is a work that requires divine power. And the only source of divine power is God. My friends, his work, which he had made. His work, it is amazing what we see when we study carefully or we read closely. You and I serve a creator. And I use the word deliberately. We serve a creator, serve his worship, because the fundamental purpose for worship is creation. 
Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were and are created. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. The reason why we worship Christ, God, because he is the creator. That's the basis of worship. And so the creator we worship is that entity, that power, that being who does for us what no one else can, who forgives sins. The priest cannot do that. We're at the spiritual level now of his creation. Let me say it again. No priest can forgive your sin because forgiveness is a work which only God can do. Are you following me? No priest can move you from heaven to hell if you pay a certain amount of money because whether you go to heaven or hell, that's God honors our decisions and cast people into hell. He honors your decision. He admits us into heaven. Not a priest. The work of Christ in our lives is a work that only Christ can do. Not Christ plus somebody else. Let me say that. A friend of mine told me I must smile when I speak because I look so mean and although I'm angry and he's quite right. But sometimes when I present these uh, messages, I'm so eager for the listeners to get what I'm saying. Do you understand that only Christ can save you? It is his work which he alone can do. And the Sabbath teaching, the root of Sabbath truth teaches us that. Can you begin to understand why the devil has attacked that commandment above all others? And so few people observe the seven-day Sabbath and see the value of Sabbath observance. Let's go on. Look at, look at that. And listen to Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And on the seventh day, now we have ten words on the screen. Three of them are nouns. Seven of them are pronouns. Listen to them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Ten times God is referred to by noun or pronoun. Ten. In that small section. And those two verses have maybe, what, 53 words or something like that. So that's one-fifth of the contents of that passage. God, God, he, his, God, God, God. Now, this is the Sabbath truth. This is the root. What we have at the root of Sabbath truth is the Sabbath is all about God. Do you observe who's missing? Mankind. Not mentioned at all. Not because... God is not thinking of them. Yes, the Sabbath will be given to them, but for the glory of God. And whenever we glorify God, we benefit. Let me say that again. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, and people take that to mean they can do whatever they want with God's day, change it, you know, lacerate it, slice it up. No, 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 no. The Sabbath was made for us for our benefit as we glorify God in a special day, special way, uncluttered by work. When we do that, we are blessed as we seek to glorify God on his holy day. And so Genesis 2, 2 to 3, highlights God, does not mention man. God, he, his, God, his, his, he, 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 God. This is a lesson in humility. What do I mean by that? Satan, the problem he had, According to Isaiah 14, 13 and 14, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's pride. But the Sabbath properly understood teaches us humility. Because where it is first presented, mankind is not even mentioned. Clearly, 
the root of Sabbath truth is that God is the center, the focus, the superstar of the Sabbath. No wonder Jesus says the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And we see that in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, because God, He, His, God, His, His, He, 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 God, all refer to Christ, particularly Christ. Now, why do I say that? In Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 8, the Bible says, this is God speaking to Christ. Very, very fascinating passage in the Bible. God, Hebrews chapter 1 has God speaking about the Son and to the Son. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Verse 9, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now listen to what God continues to say in verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, the Father calls Christ Lord, hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. Now if you don't believe what Paul says about Christ as creator in Colossians 1, 16, 17, what John says in John 1, verse 3 and verse 10, what Paul says in Ephesians 3, 9 and 10, surely you can believe what God himself says from his very lips. Thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. That's what the Father said. You see, the Bible says, Christ says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I am not sidelining side the Father and the Spirit. Don't get me wrong. Because the Father himself desires that we recognize the Son as the central figure of creation. Let's see how the Bible makes that so very clear as we keep that slide on the screen. Listen to uh, Psalm 33, verse 6, verse 9. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth, not their mouths. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast, the breath of his mouth. Let's go to John chapter 1, reading from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by Him, not them. Now again, I am not sidelining the Father and the Spirit. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. As we try to understand Genesis 2, 2 to 3, where only God is mentioned, and that is the Creator Christ. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him. Single. Singular. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Hebrews 1 verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. The Bible is super abundantly clear. Creation is the work of Christ. Now, at the request of the Father. Don't misunderstand me. The Father did it through Christ. The active agent was Christ. The voice that said, let there be light, Christ. Now, having said all of that, he, 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 a singular reference to who created heaven and earth. Now listen to Genesis 2, 2 to 3 again as we identify the nouns and the pronouns. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. That's Christ. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Christ, singular. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Jesus Christ was right. When he said in Mark 2, 27, 28, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And it is right in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, because he alone is mentioned. And those two verses, Mark 2, 27, 28, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. We see a reflection of that in the passage we just read. The Sabbath was made for Adam and Eve and for all humanity, not humanity for the Sabbath. It was made for us that we may on that day lift up the only person identified in verses 2 and 3 of Genesis 2, and that is Christ. The roots of Sabbath truth 
my listening friends. Tell us several things. Let us, well, before we summarize, let's continue. Another slide on the screen. Three things that the Creator did. Here again, we have the number three, divine number. And on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had made. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Numbers 23 verse 20 says, What God hath blessed, you can't unbless. By the way, what God curses, no one can uncurse. Let me say it again. What God blesses, no one can remove. What God curses, no one can lift that curse. The Bible identifies three things the Creator did. He rested, He blessed, He sanctified. That's what He did. It is all the work of Christ the Creator when you study the roots of the Sabbath truth. We identify the day, the Sabbath. Before that, we identify that the Sabbath celebrates a finished work. All the work that was necessary was done. So we have all, all, all. He rested, he ended his work on the seventh day. The seventh day is identified three times at the root of the Sabbath teaching. Here we have it, three times. He rested. He ended, rested, rested, the same thing, three times. His work, the work of creation is Christ's work. The work of redemption is Christ's work. He rested when his work was done, but it's his work which he had made. In other words, when you see his work, that's his activity. Follow me closely. When you read which he had made, that's his ability. In other words, God alone is able to do his work. And I hope you follow me. His activity and his unique ability. His work, his ability, his activity, which he had made, his unique ability, no one else can do it. So the Sabbath tells us that we worship a creator who has powers no one else has, including the second most powerful force in the universe, and that is Satan himself. What else do the roots of truth about the Sabbath day tell us? It is all God. Like the presentation on the Word, several dozen presentations can be made on the Sabbath, so I'm just condensing, giving you the bare bone essentials from which subsequent studies on the Sabbath can be built and constructed, all emanating from this root of truth. It is all about the Creator who is Christ. Notice He, His, 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 He, 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 all singular. And on the basis of the seven singular pronouns, we may reasonably conclude that God, God, God also refers to that central figure, that's Jesus Christ. And we saw in Hebrews 1, the Father is very happy to identify Christ as the creator of heaven and earth. He blessed, he rested, he sanctified. No human being can bless. No human being can sanctify. What God has blessed, he alone can unbless if he sees fit. What God has sanctified, he alone can unsanctify. That is why the commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it, not to make it. It has already been made holy. Now keep it. Live in conformity with what God has done on that day, not make it holy we're not called to bless the seventh day. We're not called to sanctify the seventh day. We're called to respect, maintain, guard, guide, defend jealously what God did on that day. He blessed it. He sanctified it. And we're to keep it. And the word keep this suggests treasure it. Guard it. When you treasure something, you protect it. If a lady has a mink coat, she doesn't keep it in the basement or in the laundry room cupboard. She keeps it in a special place in her, in her room. Special mink coat because she treasures it. Now sneakers that she runs around in the gym, she can throw that in the corner in the garage. She doesn't really treasure that. What we treasure, we protect. And so when the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, treasure, protect, guard what God has made, prepared, and presented to us the holy day. 
our subject for today as part of the series on the roots of truth. And we've taken a look today at the root of the Sabbath truth. And for the final time, we shall go over what we've observed about this day. It's a finished work the Sabbath celebrates. All, all, all his work. Nothing left undone. So Christ has you covered in every area of your life. He has you covered. Nothing is left undone with regard to your salvation and your physical and your spiritual happiness. Nothing left undone. We go to the next slide. The seventh day is identified. No matter what you study in Acts, Romans, Corinthians, the day of worship is the seventh day. It is at the very root of that teaching. It was on the day, that day, that the Creator ended His work. He rested, He rested three times. We're told about the cessation of the Creator's work on that day. All of that in the very root of that teaching. It's His work, no one else can do it, which He had made. He rested, He blessed, He sanctified, and of course, in verses 2 and 3, it is God, 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 He, His, He, Him. Indeed, Genesis 2 Verses 2 and 3 tell us that the God, the Creator Christ, is indeed Lord of the Sabbath. My brothers and sisters, having heard what you heard, I want you now to ask yourself the question, do I begin to understand why this commandment above all others has been so successfully attacked by the enemy? Because Satan knows if he can overthrow the Sabbath commandment, then he effectively overthrows the force of all the other nine. Because this is the commandment that holds the first table and the second. It is the hinge that connects the two. It is the one that identifies the person who issues the commands. None of the other nine does that. Not one of them. Only the fourth. When Christ made mankind before there was sin, he instituted two holy things. The Sabbath and marriage. The Bible says there will be no marriage in heaven but there'll be Sabbath observance. Ask yourself why. Of the two holy institutions, one ends with the coming of Christ. One continues forever. If that is the case, should you and I not take some time to study the Sabbath doctrine and to ask ourselves the question, am I observing God's holy day? Am I keeping the day holy so that I might receive the blessings that are reserved only for that day? May God bless you, my friends present and those listening to the recording, may God bless you as you seek to honor his holy day, a day that lifts up and glorifies the creator himself, Jesus Christ, who is not only creator, but savior. God bless you.